I'm ready to slash and burn. No quarter. I'm going to be a hot, comfortable, and hollow <laughs> from start to finish. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Outside of the Box. And everyone loved my previous mashup with two different teams the last time. So we're doing this again, um, this time with David Jin from Ribot and Lucy Dew from Valkyrie as uh, Ribot and Valkyrie are shop partners. So I thought this would be the perfect combination um and, and you also work together at norwalk um with the the smaller box so excited to have you both back on and to talk about world championship season seven happy to be here thanks for having us yeah thanks for having us yes absolutely um two two of my favorite people in robot combat by the way i mean like i always say i'm like i probably have a list of like 30 people that i say that about but i mean still there's there's a lot of people so just to be on that list is is pretty good um at, at this present moment we're at the top of the list <laughs> <laughs> you know it cycles through I don't know, like, so, sometimes it could it's, things can shift around um you know but but yeah no i'm I'm super excited. Um, you know, we only have, you know, a, a handful of episodes into the season. And given that everybody has four matches, we're still very early in the season. Um, so I, I kind of want to talk about what's happened so far and what you both think of what you have kind of left to come. Um, so getting into those first matches for both of you and obviously for Valkyrie at this point there's only been one so that's the one that we'll talk about um so David you had Witch Doctor which is like not a small task no matter what season you're talking about um and Lucy you had Mammoth um which you know also like very unique bot to fight and I think you have to come up with a lot of strategy going into a fight like that so you know both if, if you want to talk about those matches and what your thoughts were ahead of time and kind of how you felt things went uh you want me to go first okay I'll go okay. first I guess we have two two fights to talk about for robot so uh we can start with Witch Doctor um when uh when we got the announcement that our first matchup was Witch Doctor it was definitely one of those moments of not actually as much surprise as you would think. Um, Witch Doctor has been a robot that's been on our, on my team's radar for a little bit um, because we've we've kind of built a reputation of fighting a lot of, I'd say, mid-tier or newer robots um, and then curb stomping a lot of them, but then losing to higher tier robots. Um, our resume of of kind of the top 10, top 16 robots that we fought is not, is not great. Um, so we, we were thinking about through the entire roster who's a likely tester robot for us to fight um, and the one that we landed on before the season um, even started was Witch Doctor um, that being said we didn't expect Witch Doctor to be our first fight we expected them to be our fourth fight um, so the timing was very surprising however the matchup was not um, it's a matchup that we've uh, looked forward to we're honored to have um, obviously they're extremely high tier robot um, you saw how the match went. We uh, we went with our vertical vertical spinner configuration. We thought we could outvert uh, the best uh, or one of the best four wheel drive verts out there. Uh, it didn't pan out that way. Uh, we did learn a lot about how geometry works. Uh, apparently, if you have a nice, almost flat, uh, very hard piece of metal in front of your robot, it makes it very hard for other people to hit you. And uh, kind of makes sense now that Witch Doctor wins so much against other verts. <laughs> so. Yeah, the fight didn't go the way we wanted. Uh, we have not never been beat down, I think, that badly before. We took so much damage um, during that fight. Witch Doctor's upgrades seem to have worked. They switched to a brushless weapon this year, um, and they also switched to a single disc rather than their normal um, dual disc or drisk setup. Um, and yeah, it was not fun getting punched around the box by them. Uh, we learned a little bit about the durability of our uh, backplate. I think that was the first time we've ever taken a direct shot at the backplate um, in every season of BattleBots we've, we've competed in. Uh, took the hit. The The rest of the robot did not take the hit so well. Um, so, yeah, learning experience for us. Not a great way to start the season. We never like getting knocked out that quickly in, in such a destructive way. Um, but it was Witch Doctor. We knew that that's not the end of the season. 
there's no shame there. The, the selection committee is not going to look at that fight and be like, oh, well, now obviously Ribot is a bad robot. So um, it was sad. It was sad to start the season with such a huge repair job. But um, we're glad we got the, the chance to fight with Shocker. That's pretty, pretty cool. Yes. Um, it, yeah, it's like, like you said, you want that fight, but at the same time, it's like, ah, you know, for the first one, because you know, it's going to be a challenge either way. Um, there's not a foregone conclusion of who's going to win that match, but either way, it's going to be tough. And you're probably going to have some, you know, level of repair work after that, because they are pretty destructive. Yeah. We leading into that fight, we also lost our number one advantage. Um, so one of the difficult parts of fighting Ribot is the fact that we're modular, right? You don't know if you need to set up to fight a vertical spinner or a horizontal spinner. Um, a little bit of behind the scenes, this is not going to ever make TV. However, we, the night or two nights, two nights before the fight, uh, we already knew who we were going to fight. Um, they were scouting us out. We were scouting them out and everyone was trying to feel each other out for what configuration was going to happen. And then uh, we made a little oopsie in the test box. And we probably set the biggest fire that Battle Boss has ever had outside of the box. Um, huh, outside of the box. But, yeah. uh, <laughs> but uh, we, we, we set our entire undercutter module on fire. And I mean, we all 12 of our batteries went up and it was a huge fire and it was a huge hassle. And we had to evacuate all the test boxes because we like smoke screened everyone. Um, and uh, we were talking to Mike afterwards. And Mike was like, man, I'm so happy that you guys caught fire because we were freaking out about what module you were going to run and what configuration which doctor was going to run. Um, but, you know, after we uh, smoke screened the entire pits, um, they were like, oh, okay, well, I guess you guys are running the vert. So, uh, yeah, the, the number one competitive advantage that we have was kind of taken away from us. Well, our own fault, but yeah. Yeah. Um, so the... Lucy with the mammoth fight. How, uh, tell me about that one. Um, so I wasn't really sure what production was going to throw to throw at us this year because uh, with like the whole new team and everything, I wasn't sure what production thought of us and like what kinds of robots they would have us fight. Um, I think it was nice in some ways to fight mammoth first because it was my first time driving in the box um i was really nervous and at least mammoth is not super fast like i knew it wasn't going to be an overly fancy driving type of match and so then i could kind of get a little bit used to trying to drive in the box um like prior to battle lots i did a lot of practice driving at norwalk like we just went down and the staff there graciously let us use the boxes i had david kind of drive coach me a little bit. Um, but really what every driver from BattleBots has told me is that there's nothing like actually driving in a match. Like you can't really prepare for it. Um, and like I had a little bit of advantage because I have stood at the box before during a match, but it's like not the same when you're a driver. Um, so it was nice to at least know that I didn't have to do any crazy fancy driving or anything. Um, that being said, Mammoth is a very weird robot to fight. Um, we kind of, we just put on an armor configuration that was like, hopefully they won't catch on anything, be as slippery as possible on all the front surfaces. And then um, it was, the, the actual day was kind of a bit of a, it was a bit, a bit of a mess. Um, like they wanted us in the first session and then like we loaded up basically in behind the tunnels and then they were like, oh, actually we're taking a break now. And then, so we all had to like take the batteries out and like roll back and there was like, going to be a like two hour lunch break. Um, and then we loaded back up to the box. We actually got in the box and we started to fight and immediately on the first contact, we got so stuck. Um, like one of their legs got stuck right underneath between our robot and the blade. And it just really wedged in there. Um, and they have these bolts that kind of hold the different pieces together. And it twisted and kind of one of the pieces of the bolt just went through one of the cutouts in our blade. So it was just permanently stuck. Um, and I think it took like half an hour or 40 minutes or something of attempting to remove the robots from each other. And then um, at some point they gave up and we just sawed 
the leg off of Mammoth because the robot, both robots combined were too big to unload from the box together. So we had to do like a temporary separation by cutting off the leg. And then we rolled both robots outside. And like, this was as my first driving match, it was like, there was so much ramp up and then we like d got unloaded. And then there was so much ramp up and then we immediately got stuck. And so by the third time we finally loaded in the box, like separated, um, Mammoth put on a new leg and then um, we just had to take the blade off. It came off really easily and then put it back on. Uh, we loaded in the box. I was like, I just need this match to be over already. I've like, gone, it has been such a roller coaster of a day. Um, and then like, just kind of the match happened. But I, I know that Ricky wanted the match at least not to be him beheading himself, which was rather unfortunate. Um, and I was like, not entirely sure what was happening when, when um, it was actually happening in the box. But, you know, it was nice that I kind of got to practice a little bit driving around. Um, Valkyrie's so weird to drive. And um, yeah, I mean, it, it happened. I'm sure it's not the way Ricky wanted it, but um, it would have been cool to, to fight Mammoth without Mammoth beheading itself. But, you know, it happens. He was trying something new and it always happens when you try something new. Well, often happens when you try something new. So. Yes, yes, it, it unfortunately does. And I, I swear like that, you know, I'm glad that BattleBots made a lot of rule changes this year, but I feel like so far with what's happened this season, they've cursed themselves with like changing with the unstick rules. I mean, both robots getting stuck together, that's always been a thing, but like, I feel like it's happened more this season than it normally does. Like we've already had at least three of those situations. Yeah, it was crazy. The first couple of days were a lot of sticks. And like the rest of the fight, the whole time we were like, oh, we don't want to run into Mammoth too much because we don't want to get stuck in the leg again. Um, and, and I don't know if the, like at that point they would just call a judge's decision and just like be done with it, um, which would not necessarily be in our favor. So yeah, it was kind of tricky afterwards because we were all like on edge. Yeah, yeah, I bet. Um, so yeah, I mean, that was, I, I thought it was a good start to, to the season for Valkyrie. That's, that's what you want to see happen, you know, coming out of the gate, especially as a new captain. Um, so I'm sure that you had to be feeling good about that. Now, shifting back to Ribot, um, so, so Claw Viper, um, you know, I have so many questions, it, you know, obviously, we know that that robot is fast. Um, I think that it showed that in the Sin City Slugfest against Defender, um, you know, and, and like, we know that, but like, it's really fast. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, obviously that makes it hard to track, but I have to say in no like alternate timeline that I could have ever pictured in my head, did I think that I would see a match like that? Um, so I kind of have to ask David, did it take you by surprise? Um, because I mean, it certainly did for me. Um, I think it their match with Ominous was the one that really took us by surprise. Um, we hadn't seen what New Claw Viper could do. Uh, and then he fought Ominous and then we saw what New Claw Viper could do. And we're like, holy crap, that looks like someone's breaking the physics engine in real life because uh, that it doesn't look right. Like Claw Viper going around doesn't look right. And honestly, uh, I noticed this in the editing on the Omnis match. Uh, in the post match replay, I think it's the only time where you can truly see how fast Claw Viper is. I don't know how something with camera angles and whatnot during the 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 Omnis match, it didn't look as fast as it actually is. But then in the replay, it looked really fast, and that's what we see. Um, so we knew it was going to be fast. We had never seen anything like that before. I think I said it in the pre match that we kind of threw the idea of being the aggressor out the window because I mean, nothing can go faster than that. Um, so that was, uh, we were prepared for that. We were prepared for the speed. Uh, what we weren't prepared for and what to this day, we still are not sure what happened is why our left side drive uh, locked up. We, in the match, uh, we half avoid the box rush. He taps us, but doesn't get a grapple on us off the box rush. We're up to speed. Um, he gets this great grapple on us and throws us into the driver's box, uh, actually into himself, because, you know, I don't know, Kevin's crazy like that. Um, he threw Rivot into himself, 
And then when we landed, we had no left center drive. Um, and then if you watch throughout the match, it comes back for seconds at a time and then goes away again. Um, what they, what you can't tell on the TV edit is that at the end of the match, we were perfectly driving. And uh, I actually ended up doing a couple laps of the box after the match was over to see if the drive would cut out again. And it was perfectly fine. Um, after the match, we brought it back to the pits um, and everything was fine. We never found the issue. Um, to this day, we still don't know why the left side drive was locking up. Uh, everything that we thought might be wrong was not wrong. So uh, it's unfortunate that in a match that is so driving focused, we just couldn't drive. We couldn't move. Um, and uh, obviously, Kevin took full advantage of that and just bullied us around the box for three minutes. Um, so it was a little unfortunate that we couldn't go toe to toe to him with him uh, with a fully functioning robot. That being said, I think that was one of our better fights that we've ever had. Uh, even if we weren't winning it, it was still such a great like battle to to experience. Um, I think it also highlighted one of the major upgrades we made this year. Our weapon is uh, spinning up in ways that we've never had it spin up before. Um, and I think we were able to show off that we could just bounce on the weapon indefinitely, and it would it wouldn't care. It would just keep spinning. Um, we put our mark on the floor as uh, everyone hopes to do one day, and. Uh, we were really happy with that. It just the, the the driving issue, the drive failure was is a mystery to us. Um, there's uh, also something that you never saw on TV, which is we kind of broke the box. It took them quite a bit to repair the driver's box, where we hit it twice. Kevin actually threw Ribot into himself twice in the same spot, so uh, they had to they had to do a little bit of arena repair. Um, everyone was perfectly safe. Nothing. No one breached the uh, outside barrier of the box, but. Um, yeah, they had to they had to make sure that was patched up before the next match because we put some big holes in the Lexan. Um, but yeah, I, I hope it I hope it looked as good as uh, as as we thought it did. But it did. Um, it was probably my favorite fight from that episode. Um, in, in part because it was so surprising, but also like it was just a good good fight. Um, and you. You hate to be on the receiving end of that, but at the same time, like it's you got you got to be involved in just like a really great match, and and that's cool too. Um, it's the the unfortunate part is getting into the zero and two hole at the beginning of the season, which is you know I don't think where anybody ever wants to be. Yeah, speaking um, of great starts of the season. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, not not exactly what you know what I normally see from Ribot. Um, but yeah, we'll kind of talk about like what the you know in a in a conceptual way what the rest of the the season looks like for both of you. So Lucy, after that mammoth match, you know, looking at the rest of the season, I mean the, the really nice thing was is that you had the availability to know who you were going to be fighting the rest of the season, which I think most people really perceived as a, a, I mean, it's an advantage in a way, but then your opponents also know that they're fighting you. So you both have that opportunity to prepare, um, you know, but you had Banshee, Malice and Glitch for the rest of the season. Um, Banshee, of course, being a rookie bot, but not, I mean, David Small's been around the block. So like, it's a rookie bot, but David knows what he's doing. Um, and then you have Malice, you know, obviously Bunny is a, a major veteran of the sport, um, you know, and then Glitch, which has what I think is one of the most powerful weapons in battle bots, but you never know what's going to happen from a driving perspective. So kind of how did you feel about looking at, at that lineup for yourself for the rest of the season? Um, I was pretty spooked. I mean, yes, Banshee is a rookie bot. However, we also have a mostly rookie team and it's not in the like rock, paper, scissors of battle bots. It's not great for a horizontal spinner. They're, they're a flipper, which Valkyrie has seen, has had the most airtime against flippers. Um, as battle bots likes to repeatedly show the, the blip, just throwing Valkyrie in the air. Um, several times in a row but you know it's it's the wedge and the flipper is really tough for um valkyrie as a whole and so we decided that we were going to try something new with it um and it was we we built a fork you know everybody all these vertical spinners are building forks with all these like piano fingers and playing the ground game and we're like hey we want in on the ground game just kidding we don't like the ground game but 
you know, we have to find a way as horizontal spinners to kind of stay relevant, I think, because it's tough for us to beat a wedge. It's it's the most simple thing that somebody can put on the front of the robot that just kind of takes our weapon out of the game. Um, so in, a, in an attempt to try to beat the wedge, we decided to have a fork. Um, it kind of sits off to the side and in front of the weapon, but it also makes it a little bit tough for us to aim. Um, so it means that we kind of have to aim correctly. Um, and, you know, from Banshee's first fight, we saw that they're very fast. Um, and David Small is very YOLO of a driver. So, you know, against me, I was pretty spooked. Um, but, you know, I, it was our chance to kind of see how the finger worked. We kind of did a little bit of prototyping in the build space with Ribot, where we like mounted a fake finger on a Valkyrie frame and then pushed a Ribot with a wedge into it and but like and also I think I have a beetle weight that's kind of a small Valkyrie and then David kind of has a small drop four wheel drive drum. robot but four wheel drive robot that we put a wedge on and we tried like running the beetle weights into each other with like a prototype finger to see how it would work and we had hopes that it would work um so we put it on Valkyrie for the Banshee fight to see how it see how it works out um, we were kind of excited to see but also like again with any trying anything new could be completely terrible yeah yeah you never really know um and I, you know I'm curious though what you thought about fighting glitch because I think from a design perspective glitch is shaped similarly to Valkyrie um and I, I'm guessing that that's probably why the schedule makers were like hmm let's do that uh, you know obviously they have a different weapon type but what was your thought about facing them um like I mean I think both teams were really excited for the same aesthetic to be in the box together um they're well they did look very cool in the box together um, so we were excited about that. We also have like similar color schemes, so they kind of went together. But as we saw last year, glitch kind of, if you touch the weapon the wrong way, your robot just gets dismantled. Um, so that was going to be like a make sure I avoid the weapon when I kind of drive around, which is in general kind of tough. Plus glitch is always kind of like a wild card in terms of driving because they'll just sit there and not move and almost get counted out but then all of a sudden they'll like zoom across the box and then destroy something um so it's like also very scary but it was you know later on in the line so it was like a, we'll see how the next match goes and the next match goes yes exactly like you kind of have to balance that forward thinking with just taking it one match at a time so um you know We'll, we'll kind of see about that. Now, David, you had Jackpot and Scorpios for the final two matches, which, you know, those those are tough robots and probably not ones that you want to have to face when you're 0-2. So, you know, when you, knowing that, kind of what kind of plan did you have in mind, um, you know, to make sure that you would win those fights? Um. So yeah, definitely staring down uh those two next two matchups was not fun sitting at 0-2. Um Jackpot presented a very interesting uh challenge for us. Uh we know that they have a an extremely strong configuration against horizontals. We saw them take down Tombstone um a couple years ago. Um even though the robots changed a bit, I know that they they, they know how to beat a horizontal. Um at the same time, we are we're very aware of their match with Lockjaw um in their rookie season where Lockjaw is a very similarly shaped robot as a robot, uh, and Jackpot made mince speed of them by essentially immediately sniping their pulleys on the first hit, um, or something like that. So, so very early on, they sniped the pulleys. Um, so we were definitely scared going into it. At this point, we had both modules working again, so we had the choice to make, run a vert or run a horizontal. Um, we were initially thinking about running the vert, but pretty quickly shied away from that because of the Lockjaw fight. Um, and then we kind of got stuck on uh, on two. I think I'm allowed to say this. And I think a photo got posted already. So I'm allowed to say that we ran the undercutter. Um, a public photo has already been posted. So so we looked at the lockjaw fight and uh, we're really worried about running the vert because our pulleys are fully exposed and jackpot definitely outreaches our vert by many inches. Um, 
And then on the second half of that is the only time we ever really fought a gigantic vert like that was uppercut um, in 2020. And in that fight, we ran the undercutter. And although it had to take quite the beating and we ended up with a non-working module afterwards, it was able to last longer. It's significantly tankier than our um, vertical configuration. It has much more armor and it's also fully invertible. Um, so those are all very desirable traits. Uh, we figure jackpot can't hit quite as hard as uppercut. Um, so uh, that's what we ended up running. Um, we'll see how that goes. Uh, hopefully we don't end up 0 and 3, but uh, that will be a future episode. Yes, exactly. Um, and then our fourth matchup was against Scorpios. Um, they're also supposedly a known uh, entity. However, this year they brought way more front end configurations. Um, in that fight with uh, that first fight they had with Jackpot, we saw a new configuration that they've never run before. Um, and uh, looking around their pit, they just had attachments this year. Uh, we're so used to that iconic Scorpios look. Um, that now that they have so many different attachments, we weren't entirely sure how to approach the problem anymore. Um, so that's uh, that was definitely a uh, difficult decision, knowing that they can adapt. Normally, we would just default to Vert. Just Scorpios doesn't really like Verts. That's the default answer. But now that they have forks and multiple different types of forks, it, the answer is no longer that simple. So uh, your viewers and I guess yourself will have to see what we ended up choosing for that fight. Um, but yeah, everyone's improving. Um, actually, kind of on that on that same note, uh, I don't know if you noticed that every horizontal spinner this year, almost every horizontal spinner, not Trayan, everyone else has brought some form of wedgelet or wedge. Yeah, it's it's the ground game. Um, I, I feel like I've talked about that a lot lately. Um, even just with you know, I I talked to to. Um, James Cooper from Quantum earlier today about that. And, you know, the idea of, do, do you try and put, you know, forks or something like that on a robot like Quantum? I don't know, but it's like the, the ground game is is so tough and everybody's kind of doing this thing or that thing. And it's it's hard to, to you know, be the one that has the advantage in that case. Uh, but we'll... We'll see how it plays out the rest of the season. Um, I'm really excited about that, uh, you know. But of course, something else that I have to talk about um, is Norwalk because you know both of you have a plethora of different robots that you're involved with there, and I think that you know Norwalk has also, in the very short time that I've been watching, you know, basically like six months at this point, made you know so many changes and upgraded a lot of what they're doing, you know, from a production standpoint and everything else. Um, you know, what do you think, you know, has been the most significant changes in, in that kind of short period of time with Norwalk? And like, are you happy to see, you know, the things that they've done and kind of where things are headed there? Uh, Lucy, you want to talk about the new format? Um, yeah, so I think the biggest change that Norwalk has very recently done is um so they used to be a double elimination bracket um up until december but their first event in this year in january they started running um a single elim bracket so there's when you first come there's a seeding round a single seeding round um and it's based there's a whole algorithm about it and like how they split the rankings and how they deal with rankings but basically you get ranked and then um you have a single seating round and based on whether you win or you lose your single seating round you get placed in a single elimination bracket and basically the idea is that they wanted to have as many people be able to compete at norwalks as possible so they didn't like having a registration cap um, they wanted the event to be able to keep growing but the events were starting to run until like 2 a.m um, especially at the end when you have like people at the end of the bracket, you're really rushing to get like robots back into the box. Um, and you, you know, usually at the end of the bracket, the fights also get more intense as the robots are better and then more damage happens and it's harder to actually repair a lot of times too. So they're kind of really struggling with that turnaround. Um, and they chose to do single elim, uh, which I have some opinions about. Uh, I think that it's a little bit, it's tougher and significantly less forgiving for competitors. 
Um, and I think in some ways it's really hard for like first time um, builders because some like you can lose one, you can win your seating round and lose once in your first round and only have fought twice, only lost once and be out of the competition. Um, but in an attempt to kind of remedy that, they've set up a more organized grudge match system so that you could still put your name back in the, like they have a bingo ball like randomizer and they'll randomize some f grudge fights for you or you can come up with your own, find your own opponent and go up and they'll use it to kind of fill the gaps um, in between fights in the, in, the lime, in the live stream. And that way, like if you want to test out a robot, you want to test an upgrade, there's more of an organized system for that. So that way you can still fight more, but um, like your chance in the bracket, I feel like is a little bit uh, hindered. Yeah, so. um, it's uh, it's pretty cool to see the uh, what has happened at Norwalk because uh, um, I actually competed at the first ever uh, Norwalk Havoc uh, back when it was at 50 day and it was a bunch of people, mostly my teammates um, and a few other people who competed in like essentially a round robin bracket. And then we didn't, it wasn't even a bracket, sorry. We just competed in a round robin tournament. And then at the end, someone was just crowned victor. There was no bracket at all. Um, and then we switched to like the tiny brackets where we'd show up at like 9 a.m. and start fights at, I don't know, like 11 if we felt like it and everyone would be going home before dinner because there was so few bots that, yeah, even with the double elim bracket, it took a couple hours and everyone went home. Um, that was back when there was one cage and like four camera angles. Brett was still a brick back then. Uh, <laughs> and that was my first like year of Norwalks. Um, and then to go from that to the production value that we have now um, is really awesome to see. We have a now a building that's just dedicated to this competition. We have tons of boxes. We have what, six boxes now at this point? Um, we have six boxes. Uh, we have an entire floor dedicated to the pits. Uh, the camera equipment is out the wazoo now. I don't even know what they have. Um, so it's it's been awesome to be part of that growth um, and to see as um, not only the veteran competitors continue to compete and enjoy the events, but also all the new builders. Um, as Lucy was saying, they had to change the format for 2023 because there are literally just too many competitors now and it's overwhelming the old system. Um, so it's really awesome to see that. Uh, I hope that they continue to have a close relationship with their competitors um, because I think it's really important to get feedback. I think the way to avoid going down the route of BattleBots is to have a more open uh, feedback loop for the uh, competitors to the event organizers. Um, but time will tell with that. Um, it's awesome that the events are as big as they are now. Um, it's been cool being part of that growth. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, it's 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 pretty impressive. Um, and like you said, though, I I do agree completely. Like, I think listening to competitor feedback is crucial. And even like BattleBots having done more of that prior to this last season, for me as somebody who's not a competitor and just like watching from the outside, I feel like I can see the difference that that's made. You know, I feel like the the end product is of a higher quality with those changes as well, which is ultimately, I think, what you want to see. Yeah, I know uh, Norwalk does, is trying to do a good job of at least um, getting a lot of feedback from the competitors because they have an entire Discord channel set up and there's full-time staff members who mostly spend their day going combing through it and making sure they gather all of the feedback and then like talk to the staff afterwards talk to the competitors afterwards to kind of adjust it throughout the year yeah and and just as reference uh compared to what we started our combat careers doing is it's insane that there is a non battlebots level event where there are full-time employees like that is that is just an absurd fact. We these used to be things that people would run in their garages or they rent out like a space for a day where they'd set up the box with volunteers and then disassemble the box at the end of the day and that was just it. Now there's a permanent home for this event and there's people working it all the time, working on improving it. And that's just that's unheard of at this point. Yeah, I, I think that like right now is a huge time of growth in general for combat robotics, which is really exciting, you know, because I'm seeing, 
you know, some other events kind of getting bigger and robo games coming back, you know, that's huge for a lot of people that like to go to that event. So I think that it's really great um, because if it was more accessible and, you know, more kind of out there, I think there would be more people interested in it, you know, whether it be just watching it or participating. Um, so, you know, I, I, I would love to see more of that happening. Yeah. I hope the growth doesn't stop and I hope I, there are rumors about expansion, but I guess we'll wait to see if anything solidifies. Um, but yeah, we'd love to, uh, see competitors around the, maybe around the world, but at least around the country. Um, cause right now it's very East coast centric. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the East well, East coast, West coast for the most part. Um, you know, the, cause there, there are some East coast more with, with Norwalk and like Orlando maker fair is another big one. Um, but I know on the West coast, if they're bringing robo games back, cool. But also I know Southern California has a fair number of events. They do some other things in Vegas, um, you know, and things like that. So we'll see. Um, I would love to see that happen. I would I would love there to be a major event in the Midwest. Nobody would love that more than me. <laughs> um, Michigan has some, right? It, yeah, there's, well, there's MRCA out here. So like there's, there's some stuff, but like, you know, I, I would like it to be bigger. <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, I'm also kind of curious too, because I mean, you know, for for both of you, well, probably more so for you, David, because I mean, you've been running Ribot for a, a while now, um, you know, and, and Lucy, I know your situation with BattleBots is a little bit different just because you're captaining a robot that, you know, you didn't uh, originally design or anything like that, but it's still, you know, like you're, you're the captain of that now, but are you, are either of you, have you had any ideas about like, hey, I could do this other robot thing, or is the is the other robot ideas strictly limited to the smaller weight classes, and you're you know you're happy with where you are with with the battle bots? Um, I don't know, Lucy. Do you want to take this one first, or? Sure. Um, I mean, I think some. Uh, at least for me and our team, we're definitely not like the robot ideas aren't necessarily restricted to smaller weight classes, um, but making a design change on the large robots is just so much more work. And we need a little bit more heads up from BattleBots to be able to get the money and funding and plan out like a such a major robot upgrade um, to be able to do it. So it's it's tough for us to do like a major change, but I think at least for Valkyrie and the team, and um, especially Alex, who is one of the original Valkyrie team members. And I mean, also me, but we, we're we all very, undercutters and horizontal spinners kind of hold a special place in our heart, even though we know it's an uphill battle and probably a losing one against a wedge and vertical spinners. Um, but, you know, it's special, it's part of the brand, it's part of the look. And I mean, even with Hot Leaf Juice, you know, David and I, we built an undercutter. Um, and I guess at this point, I've just, you know, undercutters are everywhere. So um, I've, we kind of stick to the undercutter theme, but with other aspects of the design, um, we are a, we're open to changing and we talk about it a lot as a team, but we need kind of like a better opportunity to actually be able to bring it to life. Um, so the smaller robots, it's a lot easier to change and a lot easier to iterate. So um, like we try to test out some of our weirder ideas on smaller weight classes first. Uh, do you want to talk about uh, Alex's? Oh, um, yeah, I can talk about Alex's. Um, so one of the ideas is, you know, Valkyrie kind of drives like crap, um, being two wheel drive, all of the weight is in the front over the, the spinning live weapon shaft. So it just kind of drifts with the weapon. Um, and so we were, you know, hey, look, Ribot drives pretty well, so we should have four wheels. Four wheels would make it drive a lot better, um, or even hot leaf juice. So we were kind of, um, one of my teammates, Alex Kreese, for this past Norwalk actually built a four-wheel drive Valkyrie-esque looking robot. Um, it kind of looks like if you slammed hot leaf juice together with Valkyrie. Um, so it kind of still keeps the same front shape. The back wheels are a little bit in, so it keeps like almost V shape but it's a little bit rectangular, has uh, four wheels, and then um, 
he kind of had a little bit of fun with the the visuals of it but um, it's called Kablooey Tango it's a 30 pounder and uh, we used it to kind of test out some like the shape and he also had these extra attachments for wedgelets that he wanted to use in the front um, that we got to test in one match some things went the way we liked some things we didn't the robot unfortunately drove a little bit too like valkyrie so all of the weight was in the front only the front two wheels really did very much so the back two wheels weren't really it wasn't really a four-wheel drive robot it basically was valkyrie would again. you say they weren't carrying their weight yes they were not <laughs> um yeah so you know we it's okay because the smaller weight classes that's what they're for they're for testing out these ideas so uh, we're excited to have that platform moving forward yeah i think that that pretty well covered it is the the biggest hurdle for the big robots is that everything just takes more time and more money to to iterate um i don't know if the little robots are necessarily proven grounds uh, if you look at the entire resume of non heavyweight robots that robot has come up with it's uh it's pretty um oh sorry so uh the where was i i've lost myself already <laughs> um, oh yeah, uh, the, yeah uh, the proving rounds yeah the, the entire resume of the team robot uh small robots is all over the place we've made some crazy stuff um team members just do whatever they feel like and we end up with so many different types of robots um unfortunately i'd love for us to be able to just scale up any of those crazy and wacky ideas to the heavyweight scale but it's ju it's just so much time and money that um, what you see is very incremental improvements um, for specifically with the robot. The, the shape has kind of stayed the same over the entire course of our team, even though uh, in the middle we had a full redesign, but you can't exactly throw everything out and start from scratch. You got to still keep the lessons that you've learned in the past um, just because it's, it's, if you change too much, you risk going down a bad path and it's really hard to correct because like I said, everything takes time and money. Yeah. And yeah. like, slightly building off of that. Like with Valkyrie, we completely changed the weapon system this year. We upgraded it because um, it was always the most, the least reliable part of Valkyrie. Um, and, you know, while we upgraded it, we kept all of the old parts just in case. We made everything mount with the same mounting holes just in case it didn't work. Um, but with like the two and a half months that they gave us this year to rebuild, you know, that was kind of all we could do. And so from the outside, the robot doesn't look like it changed at all. Um, but we did completely change up the inside and kind of the most important part of the robot. Yeah, something to look out for for the rest of the season is uh, Valkyrie has never pulled off a season that uh, their weapon has made it through every match. Actually, I don't know if they've ever pulled off a season that their weapon has made it through three minutes consistently at all. So it's something to look out for to see if those upgrades uh, worked. Yeah, I, I will definitely be paying attention to that. Um, it's it's crazy because, you know, it's it's early February, but we still have so much time to go in the season. Um, really excited to to watch and see how the rest of it all plays out. Um, well, I know how part of it plays out, but there's a lot of other stuff that I don't know. So I'm, you know, I'm curious to see how that goes. Um, but yeah, um, very exciting stuff. Now, our, if if BattleBots is like, we're filming in July or August, or are you both ready to go at this point? Um, my team's plans are currently under wrap. They'll uh, they'll become public sometime. Um, I think Valkyrie will be back. Um, we we are still in the midst of discussion of what what we need to do, but I think. You know, we, one of, you know, Alex and my team likes to over plan and over buy spares. So we ended the, the season with enough spares to run another season. So, you know, we could run just as is if we need to. We're doing great on spares. Our first match was like easy peasy, which doctor <laughs> didn't even do anything. <laughs> no, nothing at all there there wasn't even a scratch there's uh, not going to be items on ebay from that fight totally not going to be an entire chassis on, a, <laughs> on ebay after that fight uh, uh yeah you you hear that collectors i know that you had your hopes up but it's not gonna happen <laughs> <laughs> um all right well um yeah lots of exciting stuff to look forward to um 
you know, I, I'm really curious for anyone that's watching if you, if you really love these team like mashup episodes, please let me know. And please tell me what other two teams would you like to see on the show? Um, uh, because I am, I am open to ideas, but, um, yeah, just thank you both so much. Um, this was exciting and we're going to see everybody next time on the show. Thank you.